Good afternoon. My name is Elizabeth Raskin, and I'm a colon and rectal surgeon at the University of California, Davis, in Sacramento, California. I'm pleased to present today on the surgical management of massive lower GI bleeding. Massive lower GI bleeding is defined as hemorrhage distal to the ligament of trites that results in the need for more than four units of blood in a 24-hour period. Typically, these patients are unstable upon presentation. This occurs in about 20 to 30 cases per 100,000, and it can be a costly occurrence due to the need for transfusion and surgical and non-surgical interventions. Fortunately, the majority of patients will resolve with non-operative management. Upon presentation to the hospital, the diagnosis starts with a medical and surgical history if possible. The timing, characteristics, and volume of the bleeding should be ascertained. Attention should be paid to personal and or family histories of bleeding disorders, cancers, or bowel-related diseases. And note the most recent colonoscopy and the findings. The medication list should be interrogated for aspirin, chronic NSAID use, and other anticoagulants. A thorough physical exam should be done with emphasis on the abdominal and rectal exam. And then lab work should include a CBC, coagulation factors, iron levels, and a type and cross. The keys to the initial management are to resuscitate and locate the bleeding. Any coagulopathies should be corrected. Initial resuscitation with crystalloid solution is recommended. However, blood and clotting factors should be administered to enable appropriate oxygen carrying and clotting capacity. The ideal hemoglobin level, however, will differ between patients depending on comorbidities such as coronary artery disease, heart failure, liver disease, and blood dyscrasias. Algorithms for management of massive lower GI bleeds have changed over the years. We can walk through this flow chart. As the patient is being assessed and the bleeding managed, an NG tube should be placed. If the aspirate is bloody, it suggests an upper source and an EGD with intervention is recommended. If the aspirate is non-bloody, consider the stability of the patient. An unstable patient should be resuscitated as best as possible to enable imaging and intervention. Historically, tagged red blood cell scans have been done, but this has largely been replaced by colonoscopy and angiography. To enable a colonoscopy, a prep should ideally be done as finding bleeding in an unprepped colon is challenging. If a prep is not possible, angiography should be performed with selective embolization. If the patient can undergo a PrEP, a colonoscopy with endoscopic treatment should be done. However, if bleeding persists after successful embolization or endoscopic treatment has been performed, an EGD and small bowel investigation should follow. And lastly, if conservative management fails, surgery should be performed. Failure is signified by persistent bleeding despite interventions, lack of identification of the bleeding source, or continued rebleeding. Surgery is needed for massive lower GI bleeds in about 18 to 25 percent of patients. Urgent or emergency surgery is reserved for hemodynamically unstable patients with massive transfusion requirements despite interventions. Patients who continue to bleed despite multiple interventions, especially when the bleeding has been located, will need surgery. In the setting of cancer or inflammatory bowel disease, this might lead us to make different surgical decisions than if the patient was not actively bleeding. For an example, a patient with rectal cancer might need a resection prior to receiving neoadjuvant therapy if bleeding can't be stopped. Likewise, a patient with ulcerative colitis needing urgent surgery for bleeding may warrant a three-stage procedure instead of two. If the bleeding cannot be located and surgery is required, an exploratory laparotomy should be performed where the small bowel and colon are investigated. Endoscopy and colonoscopy should be performed during this procedure. If no lesion is found but suspected to be colonic, a blind subtotal colectomy with either an end ileostomy or ileoproctostomy is recommended. Rebleeding after this resection is typically less than 4%. If a lesion is found but cannot be controlled endoscopically, a targeted colectomy or subtotal colectomy should be done. However, a blind right or left colectomy is not recommended as rebleeding rates can be as high as 60%. We can now review the etiologies of massive lower GI bleeds and consider therapeutic options.
Lower GI bleeding can be broken down by age with Meckel's diverticula, inflammatory bowel disease, and juvenile polyps encompassing the majority of bleeds in adolescents and young adults. Diverticular bleeds, inflammatory bowel disease, neoplasms, and arterial venous malformations make up the bleeds in adults and older adults. The conditions most commonly resulting in massive lower GI bleeds are underlined in red. We'll talk about these conditions individually and then create a general strategy for management of massive lower GI bleeding. A remnant of the vitellointestinal duct, which connects the midgut with the yolk sac, a Meckel's diverticulum is present in 2% of the population with a 2 to 1 prevalence in males. These diverticula can contain ectopic tissue, such as pancreatic or gastric mucosa. Gastric acid can be secreted, causing ulceration and bleeding of the ileum. This is usually self-limited, but can be cyclical as the mucosa heals and re-ulcerates. A Meckel's technetium scan is diagnostic or angiography if the patient is actively bleeding. A segmental resection with two to three centimeter margins on the small bowel, not a diverticulectomy, is recommended for symptomatic patients as ectopic tissue may not only be present in the apical aspect of the diverticulum. Juvenile polyps are hamartomas that can grow and bleed. Most commonly found in the colon, they can also be found in the stomach, small bowel, and rectum. They are typically sporadic, but can be part of juvenile polyposis syndrome. When sporadic, they are also typically solitary and will grow large and auto-amputate. These polyps can be treated with polypectomy versus segmental resection, depending on the size and location. If bleeding from the site of amputation occurs, endoscopic clipping can be performed to the stalk. Diverticular bleeding is the most common source of massive lower GI bleeding. While diverticula are ubiquitous in older adults, only 3 to 5 percent will present with bleeding. The majority of these bleeds occur on the right side, and the etiology is thought to be injury to the penetrating vasa recta from chronic muscular contractions. The majority resolve spontaneously, but rebleeding is quite common. Endoscopic clipping, or angiography, as our previous speaker discussed, are the first line strategies for addressing diverticular bleeding. Here is a depiction of how an endoscopic clip is applied with grasping of the mucosa at the site of hemorrhage and deploying a metallic clip. Inflammatory bowel disease typically presents with bleeding, but causes massive lower GI bleeding in only 1% of patients. It's important to distinguish between Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis for surgical decision making. Small bowel involvement or rectal sparing can help favor Crohn's disease if noted. If a patient fails conservative management, an emergency colectomy may be needed. A proctectomy, however, is rarely indicated in the emergency setting. While malignancy is a common source of chronic anemia and GI bleeding, it's not typically a source of massive lower GI bleeding. Cancer usually causes a slow, indolent bleed, which results in chronic anemia. While biopsy through colonoscopy is warranted to make the diagnosis, staging should be done if time permits. This includes a CEA level, CT imaging of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis for colon cancer, and an additional MRI of the rectum for rectal cancer. If emergency surgery is needed, segmental resection may be needed with colon cancer. While proctectomy is not favored in this particular setting of rectal cancer, diversion with urgent institution of chemoradiation may be preferable. AVMs are also known as angiodysplasias, vascular ectasias, or angiomas, and constitute a large proportion of lower GI bleeds in older adults. They are most commonly found in the right colon, followed by the sigmoid, rectum, then jejunum and ileum. They're thought to arise from chronic obstruction of the submucosal veins. Up to 90% stop spontaneously, but about 25% of them will re-bleed. These can be very difficult to detect unless they are actively bleeding. These are typically red, flat, ectatic blood vessels that appear to radiate from a central feeding vessel. They may have a diameter of about 2 to 10 millimeters. These can result in maroon-colored stool, melena, or frank hematochesia. About 15% of patients with colonic AVMs will present with massive bleeding and over half of these will recur within five years. Endoscopic clipping or fulguration is recommended when bleeding, 
and geography is also performed. Lastly, internal hemorrhoids can cause massive GI bleeding. To make the diagnosis, a good history paired with a digital rectal exam and anoscopy should be done. Massive bleeding coupled with a strong anal sphincter tone can result in bleeding up the entire colon into the cecum. Hemorrhoid banding or formal hemorrhoidectomy can be done. In conclusion, the keys to management of massive lower GI bleeding are to first resuscitate and then to locate the bleeding. Crystalloid solution should be the initial resuscitative fluid followed by blood products to maintain appropriate oxygen carrying and clotting capacity. Angiography and endoscopy are the first line interventions. While most patients can be managed non-operatively, surgery should be done for patients with refractory bleeding despite conservative measures and unstable patients. Targeted surgery is preferred, but when a blind resection is needed, a subtotal colectomy is favored over a segmental colectomy due to recurrent rates of bleeding.